start. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started in a moment. Uh, my, my name is Doug. I, I work on a red team for uh, some large financial firm. And uh, uh, today I just want to introduce you um, to Leslie Adams. Uh, she gave this talk at uh, DerbyCon this year, and she's added some uh, additional content. Um, and obviously her talk, Out with the Old, In with the New. And uh, without further ado, Leslie Adams. Hello. Hi, y'all. Thanks for coming to this talk. Um, this talk is specifically meant to open a larger con conversation between us all on command line habits. And I am going to explain that further in the talk, so thank you. <laughs> I am a former sysadmin for Linux. Uh, specifically did Red Hat uh, 6. Red Hat 6 and 5, and unfortunately 4, and CentOS. And unfortunately also Ubuntu, which I have opinions about. I love L cars, as you can see. I really wish L cars were real. I am currently an IT pen testing consultant for a civil uh, infrastructure defense contractor, et cetera, et cetera. I love Vim. I don't evangelize it. I started with Nano. Nobody's perfect. XFCE is great. And that's me yelling. Um, also, I recently became a cyborg. I now have an NFC implant in this hand and RFID in this hand. Uh, so if you want to come say hi after the talk and get my business card from this hand, you're welcome to it. So why, are, why am I here talking about this? This happens, command line usage habits affect us all the time when we're on site when we're at home, when we're teaching other people, and when we're learning from other people. It can happen on site in front of clients. What I mean by that, you can have very sloppy command line habits in front of clients. If you hit up and enter and try to edit your code on the line, up, edit your code, enter, see if you get a different result in front of a client, you don't look really very sure of yourself. And hopefully it will improve you. I really hope so. But seriously, why am I doing this talk? You can fingerprint CLI habits just like you can code. If you use the same variables in your one-liner loops over and over again, people people be like, oh, this is the same person. I recognize this. Or if you only use a certain tool set and you don't expand your tool usage, you get fingerprinted. And if you're trying to be as quiet as possible, if you're red teaming, you want to get as much chaos going as possible. Precision, there are so many tools that are written that we never use. And when we forget about how to use them, we often slow down ourselves down in the process and slow what we do. Also, tool exhaustion. Exhaustion. I can speak. Uh, so we'll have a few amount of tools that we'll use all the time. Everyone uses grip. You know, a lot of people use cat. And then we'll use less. And then we'll use like a few other things. And we'll combine them all into one one-liner. And we don't really use anything else that's at our disposal. So if we do that, what's the impetus towards making something new and improved? What's the point? Why, why do we write new tools at that point? So this tree is old. The ENIAC tree. This is the 1970 version. And I know some of you might have seen it, but some of you might not have. This is a lot of branches of distributions of in ENIAC and later Unix and what it turns into for BSD. So here's what it gets a little complicated. I went and counted all 26 public distros that listed their package totals. So just built-in commands, what have you. It averaged out to about 18,000 commands that gets installed every time you use Linux, give or take. It's too much. And we use maybe six commands. Uh, Solaris, 29,000. FreeBSD, a lot. And you see where I'm getting at. And we use not a lot of those. So there's going to be a lot of redundancies 
We use grep a lot when there's pgrep or egrep. We don't use certain commands when other people do. Why is that? And a lot of that comes from tribal knowledge. So wherever we learn, it's from somebody else generally. I, I know that there's the phrase RTFM. How many people actually read the man page now and see what it does? Does the man page tell you how to use it with other commands, though? No, not really. Uh, so media, books, videos, whenever somebody writes a book or makes a video, they're using their own experience and their own command line habits in that book. So when you learn, you're learning the way they do things. On the job training, same thing. If you're sitting behind someone and shadowing them, you're going to learn what they do. You're going to pick up some of their habits. Classes, mentors, same thing. Social media, people will put their one-liners up on Twitter, and you'll see what they do then, and they're kind of fingerprinting themselves, like, hey, this is how I type. GitHub, same thing. And we'll get into GitHub later. Uh, and IRC. IRC, back in the day, people would just say, again, RTFM. But a lot of the people in our industry are new to the industry. They're not going to have the time, and they're not, it's really discouraging to tell someone to RTFM now. Uh, so, you know, mentor them as best as you can with commands. <laughs> uh, for message boards, uh, LL Stack Exchange, please don't run the things on there without reading them first. So f for classes, are they formal, informal? A lot of formal classes will look at the most common tools that are used for the specific job that you're doing. How often does that get updated, though? And how often are your trainers updated on new commands? So what are we doing on the command line? Whoops. <laughs> so I love this tweet. How many people here use awk? <laughs> OK, a few of you. How many of you using awk use it to do anything other than printing columns out of a line or printing data? Yes, one, one person. <laughs> Thank you. So awk is a, is a data-driven uh, language, just like Perl. But when we use it on the command line, we use it to print. Where did you learn it? You probably learned it from somebody else. Like say, hey, I want to print this. Oh, well, you can use awk. Here you go. And so now you're printing columns, and you're using awk only very superficially when it's actually pretty powerful. Another thing we, uh, pipes. There are pipes everywhere. Um, every one-liner I've looked at as an admin, and even now as a pen tester, I see tons of pipes. I see commands repeated. And we're going to go through some of these. And I have anonymized the sources of some of them. So for example, we have printf, and then sorting, and then cutting it, and then using a find again with a regex type for awk, and then regex, but he's also using dot star star. So it's extremely greedy uh, regex. We've got a cat to uh, <laughs> NCL. It's just, um, there's a lot of unnecessary commands here. Even more. We have a grep going into another grep, going into an awk to print out non-brace expansion columns in what is the, one of the longest prints I've ever seen. We've got I know usage, which a lot of that is printing stuff for you. Who are you copying and pasting it to? It, it's, you know, if you know what the command does, you don't need to print it. It actually adds I.O. More. We have print, sort, unique, sort, head, awk. Et, et. You know, we, we just use the commands we know and iterate them over and over again. Maybe using a different flag, but we don't use all the flags. We don't use all the commands. We're, we're you know, we're getting very, a little narrow-minded here as, as uh, command line folks. And I will say, nobody gave me PowerShell examples. And I'm kind of curious why that is. Uh, one of my colleagues gave me 
one and there are pipes, but it made sense. It's like, okay, it's redirecting output to the next line. Okay, but so if anyone has PowerShell examples like this, please let me know and I'll add them to the talk. But everyone who volunteered kind of just like shied away and didn't give me any after a bit. Um, but, you know, it kind of begs the question, is it because redirectors in Unix are just more prevalent and that's why we don't see it in PowerShell? But don't have examples, can't tell you. So just more examples. Here, this is one of my favorites. For I, and automatically you're fingerprinting somebody if their variable is I all the time. For I in sequence one to 800, they are checking all non-defunct PHP procs and if it's over 60, it's going to kill them, but it's also going to cat the load average to show you how effective this is every time between one to 800 and then it's gonna sleep for one, but then it's gonna kill them. So that, the gist of that is we are doing that on a really busy server that's about to die. Why do you need to know the load average and how effective it is every time you kill a proc? You are just causing more problems on the server. As security people, we run commands and we don't necessarily think about how it affects the server itself. We're just like, oh, this is a target. This is whitelisted. This is in scope. Doesn't matter. It's not blacklisted. I can topple it over. Doesn't matter what I run. So when you're trying to be silent on an engagement, if you're red teaming, what you type matters. The way that you type it matters. A lot of us use tools like Metasploit. That's fine. That's not going to get you everywhere. You do use command line at times. What we type affects the server. So you're not going to look up exploit information on the same network that you're trying to attack. Why are you also going to leave a noisy CLI footprint? Yeah, you can clean it up, but there's going to be other indicators to show that you've been on the server. And I'll go through those now. So if you're running a one-liner and you're not quite sure how it's affecting the server, time is a really good indicator. So we've got an example. I'm just using grep for the word and out of a vimdocs file, and I'm counting how many lines are in it, piping it to wctacl. Same amount both times. Using grep with the C flag, it's slightly faster. So there's a lot of flags that we don't use. Um, and I'll go through a couple of examples later on. But a lot of our commands have redundancies that we just, we just don't use. And every time you pipe it, it adds a little more time to, to execute, a little more time. So the benefit here, we don't want to topple over a production box. Even if it's in scope, because we're going to be the bad guy if we're red teaming. And if, we're, if you're blue teaming, you, you've got to just like be careful. You know, It's situation specific, but next we have HTOP. So HTOP is really nice. Please don't run it on a server that is really low powered. It actually does use up quite a bit of resources. From here, you can actually see if the commands are niced on the third column. So nicing uh, makes them higher or lower priority for the server to, to actually execute and to use resources for. So uh, your negative numbers are going to be lower priority, or sorry, highest priority, and positive numbers are lower priority. So here, default to zero, it's just going to do everything at the same time. So if you want to run something in the background, go ahead and nice it. And uh, the problem is that when you start a process, you can't nice it the same way. You have to use a command, re-nice. But you can just type nice before your command, and it'll nice it for you. I love that command. It's so nice. <laughs> so also, this is true. I've done that when uh, managers are walking by sometimes at my old job, because top is basically the hacker typer, but with slightly more relevant information for people instead of just looking through a log file like I normally would do and hit down, down, down. Yeah, it's way more fun. Uh, VM stat. So this is VM stat when I was running MSF console. And you can see the number of procs running there, one. And just taking a system snapshot, and you can see how much CPU IO is done um, just by one command. 
So what I used to do was run this in screen, and screen is great for running things in the background, and just see how what I'm doing affects the server. Because, like I said, a lot of us run Metasploit and then wait for shells. And finally, one of my favorites, strace or dtrust dtrace on BSD. So this shows all system calls for anything that is running on the server. You can attach it to a process. If it, it, it's a little more handy to me than looking at PCAPs. Sure, PCAPs are you know, all network driven. This is gonna show you what, it, what it's connecting to and when and exactly what file is using the call to connect to what. The bad thing is it's extremely verbose. Please do not just leave this running in your terminal. Uh, just, just pipe it to standard out or, or pipe it to less. I usually pipe it to less. So the other good thing about strace, you can use it to detect botnets that love to fork procs. And this happened a lot when I was coming across uh, Zeus. So it would make a proc and then fork. And so the proc number changed, so my apps trace just didn't work anymore. But there are flags that will actually follow each forked process for you. So really, we want to start reviewing the commands we use all the time, our tool set. A lot of people I know, I used to do this, just put all our one-liners in a text file, just all of them and then we could just copy paste as we need them. That's good, but you gotta check on what you're typing. Maybe there's an e a better way to type it. So review any of those ways to consolidate them. You can use GitHub gists. I actually really like those. Please be smart about that. Please don't put sensitive information in your GitHub gists. Please, please, please. Um, and know what your command line inputs do. So, how can we do better at this? I have a little acronym. I made foobar different. So you can prioritize your flags. So for example, uh, sort tack u is the exact same as sort pipe to unique, but it's gonna be slightly faster, uh, easier load on the server. And these things really add up. Utility usage. Make sure if you're using aliases, be really careful. Aliases also need to be updated just like one-liners you're gonna use on a system. So brace expansion, or AKA curly boys. Please, please, it's a lot easier to read for yourself and it's a lot easier for the next person on the command line to see what you did, it's just, Please, please don't do that. Please don't put variable one, variable two, variable three. It's so much easier to use brace expansion. Account for server resources. Is your box a Conroe, just like a two core box, or is it beefy? Does it have like, you, you know, are, are you going against a cracking rig? Do you have anything else running against it in the background? Is there anyone else on the server? Really need to take these into account. It might seem like a very quick server, but just check memory, uh, check disk space. Maybe you're outputting something to a log and you're about to fill up the partition. Just be mindful of that. And finally, review any new peer tools that are out. I know that Twitter, specifically, people will update uh, GitHub and they'll say, hey, check out this tool I did on GitHub. Go look at it just to see what they use for commands, especially if they're doing maybe inputting bash into it, go check it out, or ZSH, see exactly what's being typed. Um, how are they doing it? And that's kind of the, going back to the tribal knowledge. Tribal knowledge isn't bad, but it can be harmful if we don't improve how we use what's available to us. Uh, for example, I had a colleague that didn't know that pgrep existed. They just used grep. with a you know, capital P flag, what have you, or egrep, and, or they would instead use grep tack o. There's a lot of commands now that take over for flags and older commands, 
And one of the big problems with all the commands that we get is that the, 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 we don't obsolete, sorry, there's no obsolescence of commands. We don't take them out once something is better that's written. We just leave them in there. And that's why we get up to the 13,000, 16,000 amount of tools that we saw earlier. So some of the information that we can get, I personally like to look at anything that's changed. I'll do a C time check in user bin or user S bin, uh, specifically after a kernel update, just to see what tools were updated. If you look in there, some of them haven't been updated in years, years. And so we have to ask ourselves, why are we still using tools that haven't been updated in years? Has there actually been anything that's been written that's better, that's more efficient? And a lot of times, there isn't. And some of the problems with that are we don't have granular searches for a lot of tools that we have on the server. We, you can install Apropos, which is up here, and say Apropos Firewall, and it'll look for tools that affect the firewall in some way based on the description. But if you don't have it installed, you're not gonna know about it unless you start searching repo. And this becomes a bigger problem because you can't look for, hey, what, what new tools came in the repo recently? It doesn't, there's not a good source for that. Uh, man resource searches for BSD and Linux don't provide complementary information for other tools. So man pages tell you how to use your tool that you're using right now, but they don't tell you how that tool works in conjunction with another tool. They don't tell you that, hey, maybe don't use this on this kind of server. It, it's very, um, there's no context. So they'll give you examples, but not, uh, not in a greater sense. So there are a lot of the problems that we have here and why I'm giving this talk is that we have too many tools we don't use them, <laughs> and when we use them, we're using them in a way that affects the server um, that we don't really take into account. So going back to Metasploit, you can actually see how it affects the server. I'm trying to be a patron for the server here, like, please don't hurt the server. Uh, the server needs to give you information. Don't kill it. You know, be gentle, be, be ni nice it. Uh, so. Eventually, we go back to FUBAR. Yes, all the over. There we go. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, so that's a lot that I have. I really wanted to open this up to questions and discussion because I've looked for a long time and there is no great way right now to say, hey, these new tools have been updated let, hey, let, there's just a newsletter. Like, there's no newsletter or digest that comes out. You just update your kernel and use the same tool that you're using, or somebody will write a tool, but they won't use c new commands in it. I'm saying. So, uh, thanks, y'all, and uh, anonymous donors of your one liners also. But, uh, any questions so far? Yep. Hang on a second. Do you have like any stories of where um, using the wrong commands has like made a big difference? Uh, yeah, the, you said the wrong commands? Or like non-optimal commands? Okay, um, I had a, uh, when I was an admin, there was another admin on, on staff that was working graveyard. They couldn't get the control panel to work. So instead of fixing PHP, they RPM removed PHP. They removed PHP from the whole server. Okay. And then left a ticket note with a zero byte stat of user bin PHP and left for the day. And we didn't know until the client called and said, hey, why can't I access my control panel? And we look and there's a ticket and it, the dude was gone, just gone for the day, no PHP on the server. So that's one egregious <laughs> Like, don't use your tools this way. But I've also seen one-liners where people will use find command. I, use, I love find command, it's great. Using find command and piping that to RM, I, I, I get scared a lot of times because they don't check and see what it's going to delete first. There's a print command for that. 
you can use the print flag and it'll say everything it selects and then you can use the delete flag which will prevent it from deleting directories say. So there's really good ways to use tools and there's really unsafe ways to use like really common tools also. Um, does anybody else have a question? Okay. I mean, I have another one. You have a follow-up? Yeah. Well, unrelated. Um, you said we should kind of avoid using the same, um, like, basically change up our command line habits so that we don't get fingerprinted. Um, have you been fingerprinted by that? Or do you have, like, techniques for fingerprinting people based on their command line habits? I have been fingerprinted by it, specifically bash scripts. The variables I used to use were very static. I didn't change them, and then I would just use the one-liner over and over. So when people got on the server, they're like, hey, Leslie did this because I can see this. They didn't even have to look at batch history to see who logged in or what have you. So it becomes a problem in that sense. I haven't seen it a lot with my colleagues when we're doing pen tests, but a lot of times when we're on the command line, it's to grab information from logs and at that point, I see other people's habits. I see the, you know, did I type it right? No, I didn't. I'm going to hit up arrow, you know, edit it a little bit, type it again. And so that every time we do that, you're just running it on the server. And sometimes it really affects it depending on the server resources. Anybody else? Behind you. Thank you. Hey, um, OK, so I define a lot of aliases and functions in my bash RC. And it's great for my convenience, but I worry that it's causing me to forget how to do things that I commonly do. So do you have a comment on that? Do you, do you recommend to not do that and type it in manually, or what should I do here? So I do use alias, but I kind of refresh it sometimes. Uh, Trevor, hi Trevor. Uh, we were talking about uh, LS shortcuts before. Yeah. Everyone wants the, the human readable flag on LS. So a lot of people use alias to do that human readable flag, but they also add maybe tack A to show hidden files, or they'll add another or another flag, and they'll have it preferred. Hey, this is the LS I use. Um, same as process checking. People have their you know their own BSD or Linux based flags they'll use to show the process tree, and they don't do anything else. There's going to be some reason you need to use it differently you might need to reverse it and then you have to go back and you can't use your alias anymore because now that's set to something else. So I, I like having flags at times aliased, but they're not for every use case. There's, there's no way they can be. Um, so it just go, I would just check it like every now and then. I'm not going to give you a time frame to be like, check it every week, check it every day, but just go back and refresh yourself on it because maybe you learned something new and you want to actually update it. Other questions? Are there any resources you would recommend uh, to a new user for Linux so they learn the command line properly? Uh, this one is really hard because a lot of Linux tutorials online are very similar and they don't, they're, you're getting the user experience of whoever wrote it, right? If they're learning it from someone else online, they're going to use the same thing. And this is one of the bigger problems. A lot of Linux resources online just don't update ever. They'll write it, and then they'll set it. And you'll see a page from like 2003 with the commands, and it's still up. And nobody touches it. And everyone still goes to it, and it's still getting site traffic, and it's still up there. Yeah, it's relevant, but we can make it better. We can do a little better on it. So. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're welcome to ask me. Please ask me all your Linux flag questions. <laughs> I'm not, I don't mind at all. But yeah, on, honestly, online resources, they're good. They're a good starting place. And this is part of the problem. There isn't another resource hub, and maybe I should make this and then cry every night for <laughs> ways to improve your, your bash foo, your, your ZSH foo. Um, just to make it more efficient on the server and you. Maybe I need to make this resource. Any other questions? All right. Uh, everybody, uh, give Leslie a...